All right, dirt and rust and grime and whatever. This is sort of the, the last pass. Once you've got all your materials down, it's a good idea to add some things that make the materials look a little bit lived in. Uh, for instance, this is a very smooth, clean surface here and I would like to break it up. So I'm gonna hop over to my rubber grip. This is our paint drips here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and name this layer. And we can turn symmetry off. We're not probably gonna be doing a whole lot of painting here on out. So I'm gonna add a fill and I'm gonna turn off everything except the roughness. The roughness is all I wanna modify. And you can see if I grab the slider here, I have a, a global value that I can modify. And if I turn this off, what we're getting is the roughness contribution from our little rubber layer here. So I basically just want something that's gonna break up that specularity. So I'm gonna come over and add a black mask and then I'm going to add a fill and we can go over to grunges and I want something that's got a lot of light and a lot of dark and doesn't feel too weird. Like this would, this would probably show up as being pretty obvious, but something like this might work pretty good. So I'm gonna click it and drag into the grayscale here. And you can begin to see how it's influencing that material already. And if I turn on the, uh, the mask by holding Alt and clicking on the mask there, you can see how, uh, how that looks when it's applied to the surface. So everywhere that it is light, we're getting this layer's roughness and everywhere that it's dark, we're getting the rubber's roughness. So I will just tap the M key. With that grunge selected, we can take a look at the balance and see what makes the most sense for how we want those materials to kind of interact with each other. And then we could also click on the main fill layer itself and modify that roughness. And really what we're looking for is something that's just different from whatever the rubber value is. So the rubber value is 0.39. So for our roughness variation, which I should probably uh, name this layer here, So we just need this to be different, right? So if it goes this way, it gets shinier. And if it goes this way, it gets a little bit duller. So we can go a little duller with it. And then also, now that I've got it kind of figured out, I'm gonna enable height and we'll just add a little tiny bit of height variation to that, uh, that layer as well. So now what we have is something that kind of reads as being like this might've been the original surface and this is the surface after some use where that original surface is worn down. So we have two different specularities and two different uh, color values, just barely, mostly just as a result of, of, of the height, which again is, it's a relative difference between layers. So if I were to, I guess, probably turn this off, well, we can still see it because it goes all the way down to the chrome. Anyway, um, we've sort of talked about the height stuff already, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. But, so there you go, that's a, a really easy way with just one layer to add some nice variation and some nice subtle damage to uh, to some rubber. And then if we look at these two materials up here, the chrome doesn't really have a lot of rust on it, but this material here does. So this is clearly a, just a different metal than what's going on here. So for the chrome, we can do something kind of similar. I'm gonna go ahead and we'll just put this into a folder, which is probably something we should have done at the outset. And I'll call this one chrome and I'm gonna add a black mask. I know that's off the recording area, but I'm sure at this point you guys have seen me do that a few times. Uh, and let's see, we'll go to Chrome and then um, I want to add a paint. And into the paint, I'm just gonna put all of these faces. So now I'm gonna need another metal material for up here and uh, we can just go ahead and make a new one. So I'll make a new folder and we'll just call this one iron or something just so we sort of know what's going on. And we'll add a fill inside iron. Gotta make sure it's actually in the folder, there we go. And make it all the way metal. And iron, we'll add a black mask and then we'll add a paint. And we can just go ahead and basically do a drag select on all of those surfaces. So now we have two different metals and I can come over and make this one maybe a little bit darker and maybe not quite so shiny. 
So now we're just starting to get, you know, just a little bit closer to what's happening there. So we still have our nice Chrome here. So now that I've got that, I will go into Chrome and we'll make a nice fill layer in here and call this one roughness variation. And we're basically going to do the same thing here. Turn everything off, except this one probably doesn't need, like it's not ever going to need the height. We're just going to do a little bit of a roughness variation in here. So we'll add a black mask and a fill. And this one worked before, so we'll just use it again. And there you go. That's that's the contribution of that, which I think actually looks pretty good. And then for our iron, I think there's actually a pretty decent rust material. So they have a bunch of things in here that are, I mean, we already looked at the metals, but you've also got some, some fabrics. If I mouse over, I can kind of see what's going on there. And many of these have more complex setups than what we've been looking at. So we can we can use uh, a few of these. I, I prefer for the for the beginning tutorial stuff. I really like it to be something that we just build from scratch. But using the materials is useful. Using the smart materials is, is also very useful. This smart materials are basically just combinations of things where they've already been set up to have certain behaviors. So OK, it should be pretty obvious what we're going to do at this point. We're going to add a black mask and we're going to add a fill here. And we'll go to the grunges. We'll grab that same one. And I need to make it either on or off. So I'm going to come to my balance and punch up the contrast. And you can sort of see what I'm looking at, right? Like that's kind of where I'm going. So it's still a little bit heavy, but not too bad. So maybe we'll add a fill over the top of this and uh, one of these, and we'll set this to subtract. So we're basically just removing, sorry, I meant to do this one. We're just removing a little bit out, but if we increase balance, we'll get it a little bit more subtle. So just a way that we can dial in what's going on there in terms of the placement of the rust and the dirt. Maybe that's a bit much, but anyway, you get the point. You can certainly keep fussing with it kind of forever. But let's show you a, a couple more things here before we wrap this up. The first one is you can kind of see there's this grain on the hammer up here and the, uh, the iron section. And we're going to use this anisotropic procedural here to try to replicate that. So it's going to go underneath the rust. So I'll just make a new fill. And we'll call this one, um, once again. And we'll do all the same stuff we've been doing. Got it here in the roughness. And I'm going to add a black mask and a fill. And then we'll just drag the uh, variation up into our fill. And we can see kind of what's going on. I'm going to increase the value here on the roughness so that we can get a better sense for for what the fill behavior is doing. I'm going to set this to triplanar projection because I don't know what the UVs are doing and I, I don't have a whole lot of faith that they're going to be oriented in the way that I need them to be oriented. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to do a little bit of rotation because I need this pattern to be moving vertically. So we'll set that to 90 degrees. The scale needs to be increased kind of a lot. We don't want to see big stripes like this. So I'm going to set this to four. There's no cost. It doesn't make something more or less expensive to do this. So you just need to set it to whatever you want to set it to. But if you go too high, then you'll, you can start to see some tiling potentially. And you, you can get a thing that's called a moiré effect, which is where you get a, a tiling pattern and it begins to kind of broadcast out that it is tiling. You see it sometimes if you're looking at like uh, two sets of chain link fences on an overpass as you drive under, you see like there's that bigger pattern. That's just where I notice it. All right, so that is gonna be, a, I think, an okay grain. Uh, now I just need to dial it down a little bit in terms of the roughness value so that we're getting something that's a little bit more subtle. So that'll make it feel like it's a, a bit of a different material from 
from our Chrome area down here. And I think that's probably going to be OK. Right, so that is a uh, hopefully a, a reasonable introduction to how to use Substance Painter. You don't really need this material there anymore. I want to show you one last thing here, which is how to make a decent looking render. Right now you could take a screenshot. I'm going to go and expand this over so we no longer need the reference. You could just hit print screen and have this be your screenshot. You can hit tab, which will hide the user interface. Toggles that off and on. But Substance Painter comes with a really nice renderer in it. If you go to mode here and click on rendering, you can access it. So you can see it's kind of resing in and it's got this background here. And what's, what it's doing is it's actually calculating the background reflection, the lighting, I guess we've got a sun up there, like the, the, this is called um, IBL. So this stands for image-based lighting. And, and it actually knows that there's a huge amount of light coming from this part of the scene and there's a lot less coming from the ground versus the sky and whatever, and it gives you this, this really nice result. But I actually don't care for the background. I like it to just be kind of a, a flat, boring background because this is very distracting and I don't know why a hammer would be floating in the middle of a field. So one of these, I think it's this one right here, this little icon for display settings, you can change uh, oh, the panorama, the, the, the image that you're, that's being used for the lighting to any of these, and you can experiment with those as you like. They have a, a pretty significant amount of uh, influence on the image. And then uh, you can also, you can rotate the environment by holding the shift and right mouse button. And you can see my little slider there is going crazy as I'm just rotating around. So you get the lighting set up the way it needs to be. If you scroll down a little bit further into the dome section, you can activate clear color and you will get just your geometry with the textures without anything going on in the background. And then you can uncheck ground and the shadow will go away. And I think that's very nice. There might even be a separate control for ground shadows, but I don't think so. And I usually will do something a little bit darker, not all the way black, just to get it to stand out nicely. So you can just kind of figure out what the correct position of the lighting needs to be and let it sit for a little while. You can increase the quality. It's not really necessary in this case, but uh, I think it's right up here. You can see it's still rendering. It's gonna go ahead and, and complete 1000 iterations, which is just getting uh, more and more detail in there. And then once it's done, that's the screenshot that you take. You just hit print screen and go into Photoshop. Uh, there's probably a way that you can you can save the render right here. It's going to save it as a PSD, I believe, but you may have some options there. Um, JPEG, great. Okay, so that's an easy way to save out the render and you can set the, uh, the screen resolution here as well. So this is how I'm going to want you to turn your work in. It's got to be rendered using Substance Painter's rendering mode, which uses iRay. I want a gray background and no ground shadow, unless like whatever you're making actually makes sense to have a ground shadow, which usually it doesn't. So hopefully that is clear. If you are interested in learning more about Substance Painter, I have a couple of tutorial series that you may find useful. One of them is the Substance Painter Crash Course, which is on YouTube, and there are going to be if you click on click on the, the first link, there are going to be some um, source files that you can download. I think I might make these available to you for free if you're one of my students. Um, you don't have to pay any money, but you can also just watch it. It's it, in fact I I know for a fact I've already made these these videos available. I just have to put a link in the syllabus if I haven't already done it by the time you watch this. So anyway, this is a good crash course. It's going to cover a lot of the material that we covered, but some additional stuff as well. I like it. It presumes a more uh, advanced high poly source model. Uh, which is normally going to be how, how this happens. And then I've got this other tutorial series, which is a game art pipeline, which is very extensive and covers a lot of the content that we have talked about in class uh, this semester, or we'll talk about, but it goes into a lot more detail. This is one of the projects, one of the final projects for a more advanced class in my curriculum. So if you're interested in checking this out, I'd be happy for you to do so. If you want to touch base with me to find out what specifically you should be learning about, based on your own personal interest, please feel free to reach out as well. You can either speak to me in class or you can shoot me an email or you can even reach out over YouTube if you like. So, um, okay, thank you very much. I hope this was informative and I, uh, I look forward to seeing what you do with it.